Modern Plymouth is a thriving seaside town set, appropriately, on Plymouth Bay near Cape Cod. Its architecture is a mix of function and history. Modern houses and shops commingle with historic buildings and statues, commemorating Plymouth's most famous residents. The Pilgrims are still very much a presence in modern Plymouth. The town perches on a steep hill, and if one walks up it, one eventually comes to the site of the Pilgrims' first church, and next to it, their burying ground. Mementos of the separatist Christian faith that drove the Pilgrims to leave Europe and found a new society on a distant shore. Unlike the Puritans, who consider themselves members of the Church of England, the Pilgrims believed their theology different enough as to warrant separation, which brought them afoul of English law. The group that would become the Pilgrims fled to Amsterdam. However, the Netherlands proved not to be the answer. The Pilgrims grew concerned when their children began adopting Dutch practices which they viewed as overly secular. William Bradford, leader of the Pilgrims and one who, as Moses Coit Tyler writes in A History of American Literature, deserves to be called the father of American history, equated the Pilgrims to the Jews in the Old Testament, describing them as a people who must continue to journey until they found their Zion. The search for a home was not over. The Pilgrims decided to voyage to America then, and to found a society consistent with their own religious and social ideals. After some false starts, they chartered the Mayflower, and 102 of them departed for the New World in September of 1620. A replica of the Mayflower now floats in Plymouth Harbor, and above all, I was struck by how small it seemed, how insufficient to hold 102 passengers plus crew. As you can see from the tourists climbing the half deck, the ship is very human sized. With a hull of only 90 by 25 feet, this ship would have had to ferry the pilgrims and their supplies across the Atlantic, and the sailing wasn't smooth. As Bradford writes, after they had enjoyed fair winds and weather for a season, they were encountered many times with crosswinds, and met with many fierce storms with which the ship was bitterly shaken. The ship cracked and leaked and had to be repaired several times in the middle of the Atlantic. Return to England was contemplated. But the pilgrims forged ahead and before they landed to allay worries of lawlessness on landfall, they drew up one of the crucial documents of American history, the Mayflower Compact. In it, they joined into a civil body politic and swore to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony. As Rod Horton and Herbert Edwards write in Backgrounds of American Literary Thought, the Mayflower Compact was unmistakably democratic in implication. In contrast to European feudalism, the Pilgrims, Bradford writes, met and consulted of laws and orders, both for their civil and military government as the necessity of their condition did require. In other words, the Mayflower Compact is a direct antecedent of our American democracy. Purportedly, Bradford and others stepped from a landing craft onto Plymouth Rock, a part of which is preserved in modern-day Plymouth. Upon reaching land, Bradford writes, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean, and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof, again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth, their proper element. They had arrived in a beautiful area full of wildlife, surrounded by rivers and salt marshes, but the land then had a different face than that which you see now. The pilgrims realized they were beset by a host of new difficulties. As Bradford writes, it was winter, and they that know the winters of that country know them to be sharp and violent, and subject to cruel and fierce storms, dangerous to travel to known places, much more to search an unknown coast. Besides, what could they see but a hideous and desolate wilderness, full of wild beasts and wild men? The whole country full of woods and thickets represented a wild and savage hue, 
If they looked behind them, there was the mighty ocean which they had passed, and was now as a main bar and gulf to separate them from all the civil parts of the world. As the pilgrims explored the shore, they quickly encountered the area's original inhabitants who understandably ran away. The pilgrims followed and eventually came to a small settlement in which they found and took bean stores and corn, intending, Bradford writes, to pay the native people back when they met again. Bradford quite rightly credits the finding of the corn with saving the colonists, who otherwise would probably have starved. Outside of modern Plymouth exists a replica Wampanoag home site, part of a not-for-profit museum called Plymouth Plantation, which also built the Mayflower replica and a scaled-down replica of the Pilgrim's Plymouth Plantation. In the home site, native people dress in traditional period garb, practice and preserve traditional skills, and share information with museum goers about Native American history and culture. In a way, this follows the practices established some months after the Pilgrims' landfall. Although the initial relations between the settlers and the native people were acrimonious, in the spring of 1621 they reached a peace which lasted for 54 years. Once again, the Pilgrims became indebted to the native people, one of whom showed them, as Bradford writes, how to set their corn, where to take fish and to procure other commodities, and was also their pilot to bring them to unknown places for their profit. Without this help, it is probable the Pilgrim settlement would have failed. About half of them died the first winter. Still they managed to craft a small town, a replica of which is presented here as part of the museum. This town is about one-third the size of the original, and shows, based on a sizable amount of historical research, how the Pilgrims lived around 1627 seven years after they made landfall. There are fields and gardens, animals and costumed role players who can and will talk to visitors. As you can see, the town is quite rough by our standards, and indeed by the standards of the cities in Europe and England, but they survived. As Bradford wrote, it is not with us as with other men, whom small things can discourage or small discontentments cause to wish themselves at home again. We are well weaned from the delicate milk of our mother country, and inured to the difficulties of a strange and hard land, which yet, in a great part, we have by patience overcome. Plymouth Plantation endured and grew into the modern town you can visit today. But more importantly, the Pilgrim's way of running the town embodied in the Mayflower Compact, provided one of the key foundations for American democracy and grew into our modern American way of life.